So check, check that uh, you don't defraud your master in the, the disguise of being smart and fast. And don't take for granted that you have earthly masters that are believers. And so you take them for granted. Take them for a ride. Because you know they won't talk. You take them for a ride. Uh, do the things you are not supposed to do. And when they want to talk, you say, I thought he was a Christian. Uh, all of those things. Uh, it, it, what, what comes to my mind now is the account of Haggai, uh, the maid of uh, Sarah. I many of you remember Haggai? The maid of Sarah. You know, uh, it was the Madame Sarah that asked Abraham to take her and uh, have children uh, for, for her. And you know, tradition permitted it that time. Tradition permitted it. So Abraham was not committing any sin. Tradition permitted it that your, your wife's maid would bear children. And you know, she's the maid of your wife. And so under that bond, every child she gives birth to becomes the children of the mistress. Yeah, becomes the children of, because she's a slave to the mistress. So whatever number of children she's going to give birth to are the children of the mistress. So, Sarah did that believing that since she was past the age of delivery by human calculation that uh, it would please God to you know, provide successors for Abraham through the maid. But you see, the maid, the moment she took in, that thing came up. That thing that normally worries women came up. And uh, she wanted to show that she's more than the mistress. And she, she forgot that the fact that Sarah was a godly woman. You know Sarah was a godly woman. Hope you know that. Sarah was a godly woman. And that is why the New Testament refers, you know, that makes her an example of godly women. When, they, when, when Paul, Peter was talking about... Uh, uh, to their wives, to be submissive to their husbands. He, you know, Peter used Sarah as a model, you know, to talk to women to submit to their husbands as Sarah. So Sarah was a godly woman. So when she did that thing she did, Sarah handled her. And you know, when your master handled your, your mistress, Sarah handled her in such a way that she saw her and, and ran away. And so when she ran away, the angel of the Lord met her and said to her, where are you going to? What are you doing here? She said, I'm running away from my mistress. She's so wicked, you know. When they want to correct you, they are so wicked. You know, those of you that have been mistress, you know, we had bait. You are so wicked to your maid. When you want to correct them, to them, you are a very wicked woman. So when Sarah handled and she ran away, and the, the angel said to her, you are pregnant, and that seed is going to be great. But you need to go back to your mistress and submit to her. Go back to your mistress and submit to her. Now, this tells us that as long as you are under bond, you need to regard your masters, your mistress. You don't take them for granted because they are godly people. You want to do anything. You can do anything you want to. Sometimes you do things without permission. Not because you think they are Christians. And if they talk, they have lost their salvation. If they want to rebuke you, they are no longer godly people. So you take their simplicity, you take their Christianity for granted, and so you do things as if you are even the one in charge. Ah. Gets more sense now. 
and know that, look, you are somebody's servant. And you are there to, what is servant? Someone that provides service. And his slave had a price on him or on her. And that is why under that yoke of whatever transaction was made, you need to submit yourself and fulfill the terms of agreement. So what is the terms of agreement in that workplace where you are learning your trade? What was the term of agreement? You are subject to that bond. And you need to respect it. So even if it is the Holy Ghost that owns that place, respect the bond. Don't take the person for granted because the person thought you are a Christian. Thought you are a Christian. And many people have blocked the way of others because of their attitude towards their Christian doing ministry in order to get your reward. Now, when we understand that, that as servants, we have a master over us and we need to follow the instruction of the master to get job done, when we understand that, things will run well. But when we begin to argue and want to do things our own way, not the prescribed way that the master has prescribed, you have trouble. And servants can be happy under any master. Servants can be happy under any master or any mistress if they do their work well. Stay focused. If you, if you just feel that you can't serve again, leave that place. Pack your things and leave. If you just feel you can't serve, you can't be under authority there, please leave that place. Don't stay there. Don't create trouble there. Leave that place quietly. Pack your things and leave that place because two lords cannot be in one, car, in one ship. Pack your things. Leave that place before you give your master a bad name or your mistress a bad name because you know sometimes we want to avoid that and we allow them to do whatever they want to do don't spoil things that will take you years to fix things that take you years to build they just destroy it because you don't want them to say you don't want them to say and you know Paul warned that servants should take their job seriously and be careful the way they relate with their master and honor them because they need to protect the image of Christianity out there. Be diligent in your service as to protect the image of Christianity so that the name of the Lord and his doctrine will not be blasphemed. So sometimes you do things being blasphemed out there. Let's run to chapter, verse 3 and let's see how far we will cover this evening. From verse 3, we covered verse 1. And Paul, when he, you know, he ended that verse, that chapter, two, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, ended, he said, exhort and teach these things. This thing should be exhortation on what the attitude of a servant should be towards his master or his boss. Paul went into a summary because you know at, at, at this chapter is summarizing the letter now if you recall when we started in chapter 1 he reminded Timothy of his work description in chapter 1 verse 3 if you recall he told Timothy why we left you there is to teach so that others will not continue in their error to stop people of teaching error that is why you are there so in summary he re-emphasized, he re-emphasized the duty of Timothy as pastor in Ephesus. Why were you kept there? So he had to re-emphasize as he was concluding this first letter, reminding Timothy that you are there to ensure the preservation of doctrinal purity and the doctrinal purity of the church. That is why you are there. To ensure you teach that which is correct so that those, you can stop those who are spreading false teaching as it is still spreading like wildfire today. And you know, false teaching today is much more celebrated now than it were before. False teaching. Teachings that are not scriptural, you know, 
it's fast spreading like a wildfire and it's popular. It's embraced. So Paul reminded Timothy of this and said, if anyone teach otherwise, now the otherwise is another doctrine. If anyone teaches something else, from chapter one he has been teaching, he had taught several things. He had taught on leadership. He had taught on ordination. He had taught on, you know, our relationship with one another and all of that. Touching our salvation, touching our growth in grace, touching about how the church should be administered. All of those things have been taught. And he said, look, if anyone teaches another doctrine that is not in consonant with the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is a person. In his days, there were people who were busy, you know, claiming they know too much. They know too much. And so they come up with a lot and lot of theories and wanting to drag God into it. Like we still do now, we can bring one kind of thing and drag God into it. We are not bringing it from the word of God. We just look for something, sugarcoat it, and drag God into it and get people deceived. Get people enticed. So if any man, any man means any man, whatever that person carries as a title, if any man, if any man means any man, check. He didn't say if one small pastor. He says any man, whether he's a small pastor or a big pastor, whether a young pastor or an old pastor, whether a graduate pastor or a non-graduate pastor, if any man teaches otherwise, you need to check. Because there are teachings that are otherwise. Teachings that does not agree with what Paul calls here as the wholesome word. My Bible says wholesome word. What does your version say? Wholesome. Now what do you understand by wholesome? Complete. Complete. So it means that the word of God is complete. And if it is complete, it is sufficient for mankind. So you don't need an addition to what God's word says because it is wholesome. It is complete. And so if anyone wants to be godly, the person must go to the wholesome word, even the word of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what makes it wholesome is because it talks about a person and his works and is the person of Jesus Christ. So if anyone teaches anything outside, outside Jesus, Paul advised Timothy to withdraw from that person. Don't make friend with that person. So he warned Timothy to withdraw, to have no fellowship with those who refuse to consent who refuse to submit, who refuse to adhere strictly to the wholesome, complete words that have direct capacity to heal the soul and to make men godly. Now, if you recall, in Romans chapter 1, verse 14, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Now, what that implies is that no one is saved outside the gospel. Salvation is revealed in the gospel. The gospel reveals salvation. So Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel 
because it is the dunamo of God in transforming lives. So if lives will be changed for society to be changed, then the preaching and the teaching of God's word must be taken seriously. It must be taught the way it is. No sugar coating. Preaching of God's word make it looks inviting, appeasing to the itching ears of people. Not actually dividing the word of truth. And Paul said, look, if it is not the wholesome word, withdraw from such people. The complete word of God. Withdraw from those who teach something that is strange to the doctrine that is according to godliness. When we don't submit to the wholesome word, we create mischief. We create strife in the body of Christ. So any doctrine that cannot affect people to be godly promotes or generates mischief in the body of Christ. So we need to check again the content of the messages we celebrate. What are the content? Are the content wholesome word? Or it is one cut and join something that somebody has done to get your attention and make you his disciple and not Christ's disciple. And you know why, why we, we, the church was instituted was to make men disciples of Christ. But you see, we have ended up making men our disciples and not disciples of Christ. And that is why if you talk against my Jew, I can kill, I can kill you. But if you talk against Christ, no, but don't talk about my daddy. <laughs> don't talk against my papa. But anything can be said. They can use Christ and do comedy, no wahala. They can use Holy Ghost and do comedy, no problem. But you use my daddy, Gio. You use my papa and do commentary. Uh, is it comedy? Comedy? comedy and do comedy I, 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 I finish you. I finish you. It's, it's as bad. You know what I'm talking about now. It's as bad as that. Men are not disciples for Christ. They are disciples for ourselves. Why? We preach ourselves. We are not preaching Christ. So when we tell them how rich we are, how rich we are, we, we make ourselves the example and not Christ. We don't tell them the truth, how we cut corners, but we just tell them how wonderful we have been, the, the way God is giving us money. We are not telling them we are extorting from them. I say if you want... It's another opportunity to even, we'll, we'll look at that extensively as we proceed. So what, what Paul is concerned here is a message or a preaching that does not agree with the person and the works of Jesus Christ should be discarded. So when I stand to preach, when I stand to teach, what should be in your mind is where is Jesus in this message? I don't know if you are following me. What should be in your mind as I am preaching, as I am teaching is, in this message, where is, where is Jesus? Where is the work of Jesus? Because my work can save you. And that is why I'm not ready, you can't stress me. I refuse, honestly, I have taken a position not to be stressed by anybody now. Because no matter how I stress myself, it can help you. But you know the works of the person that can save you? The work of Jesus. 
So as you listen to the message, as you listen to it, is it the work of the pastor that is being preached or the works of Jesus? Which works? Now it's hard to know, is this wholesome? Or is it cock and bull story? Because if it is not centered on the person and works of Jesus Christ, then it is a cock and bull story. It is not wholesome. That which is Christ centered has the capacity to affect the souls of men. And that is why Paul emphasized on it. And as he progressed, you know, in the church, I think in, to the church in Corinth, he said at the point, he said, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Now, Paul did not say, woe be me if I don't preach. If I don't stand on the pulpit. Woe is me if I don't go on crusade. He didn't say that. He said, woe betides me if what I am preaching is not the gospel. It's as serious as that because anything outside the gospel of Jesus Christ, it has no power to save mankind. So if I preach miracle, my miracle, how I went to Cameroon and did miracle and delivered people from death, it has no capacity to save a soul. But can it bring people to my church? Yes, but cannot affect the soul. So I have crowd, but souls are not affected. Because what I preach is not wholesome. It's not Christ. Christ is not found. His works is not found. It is the show business of one big man of God. Do a survey. It's homework. Do a survey. Go to the big, 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 big churches and ministry. Sample opinion of the crowd. Just find out if they know Jesus. You'll be shocked. You'll be shocked at the response they will give you. What was the message on Sunday? What did the Lord say in that message? You'll be shocked that all you will hear happen on Sunday was our G.O. declared, our Papa said, our Mommy said, Nobody heard the Lord. Remain like that. Because you see, if we are serious in preaching the gospel, the wholesome word of Jesus Christ, Nigeria will change with the number of churches we have. Honestly, with the number of churches we have, 12 men, just 12 men, turn Jerusalem upside down. Just 12 men just turned the entire city. And when the church started growing, they looked for a way to stop the growth of the church. Attacked the apostle, did all manner of things, but they continued in the teaching of the gospel. And even those who were martyred, those who took over, took over the teaching of the apostle. What was the teaching of the apostle? The person of Christ. The person. No, it's not about what you can do. Nobody's interested because what you can do as a preacher cannot save anybody. What you have done, the things you have accomplished, can't save anyone. If it, if it were possible, people would have been saved. So Paul emphasis is here, when you hear all of these things that you can't find Christ, withdraw. Timothy, withdraw. Withdraw from those who refuse to consent, who refuse to submit, who refuse to adhere strictly to the wholesome words that have the capacity to heal the soul and can make men godly. A man that refuses to agree with the wholesome word, Christ-centered teaching, is a false teacher. Any man, any preacher, that refuses to consent or to agree with the wholesome word, with Christ-centered teaching, is what? Is a false 
teacher. It's a false teacher. So when the content of a person's teaching is centered, is not centered on the person and the works of Jesus Christ, it is a false teaching and doctrine. When the person's teaching does not agree with the apostolic doctrine and the truth revealed in God's word, it is false doctrine. And so, Timothy withdraw. Withdraw from anything false. Whether a false teacher or a false doctrine, withdraw from it. Don't accept it. Don't promote it. Don't be part of it. Don't celebrate for Even if it's popular, don't, don't be part of it. And so, and so, for me, I can say that Paul was telling Timothy, don't be part of ecumenism. You know what is ecumenism? Ecumenism is not just the coming together of churches. It's the coming together of all religion. That's ecumenism. So, Christian, traditional juju worshippers, uh, juju priests, uh, Buddhists, all the things, the religion you can think of, witchcraft, we come together. All of us, our power comes from who? From God. So let's come together and unite. And there is a popular preacher in this town that is fronting it. In this town, fronting it. That God has sent him to bring war religion together. Timothy, even if it means standing alone, withdraw from that company. Because, you know, if you belong, you become popular. You can't be popular. Your voice won't be heard until you belong. Timothy, they don't need to project you. Withdraw. Withdraw from them. The essence of all of this amalgamation, which, which is not helping. All this amalgamation it's more political than Christ. Ecumenism is more political than Christ. Let's curb under one umbrella as Christ. Forget it. Check. It's more political. It's more political. Christ is far. Timothy Anything that is preached and is taught, promoted, as popular as it may be, that is not the wholesome doctrine, please withdraw from it. Withdraw from it. Any man doing that is ignorant, knowing nothing. They may have the language power. Do you know having the language power does not make what you are saying truth? Follow me carefully. We are, we are closing this thing. You can have the language power and you can speak convincingly. It doesn't break the message. Truth. If it is void of the wholesome speak well. Well articulated speech. They can hold you spellbound when they talk. And wow, what I didn't see it that way. But if you are not careful, they are gradually shifting you from the truth. So, Timothy, you need to be careful and check the content of every message. Check the content. It is the content of the message that will help you discover or know who is talking. Is he a correct person or a false person? Because you know, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit. 
So how do you know a good tree? You know them by their fruit. You know a good tree by the fruit it bears. This orange tree is a good orange tree because you've tested the fruit and it's nice. This one is a bad orange tree. It's not because the tree is bent. It's because the fruit on that tree is bad. It's bad. So, what is coming out of him? Is it the wholesome truth? That is what would determine if he is correct or false. So, Timothy, withdraw, pull out from those who promote what is not the correct thing. And you know, it was the psalmist that said, the fool have said in his heart, there is no God. Have you, have you read that scripture before? Psalm, is it Psalm 14? The fool have said in his heart, there is no God. Now, if you check the Hebrew writing, the Hebrew presentation puts it this way. The fool has said in his heart, no God. The fool have said in his heart, no God. So, what that scripture projects in the original is that the fool resists God. He said, no God. And so these people, even when the truth is glaring, they say no. And we will discover why they say no. They say no. If we preach it that way, it's not going to work. Things not going to fall. So let's, let's do it the, th the way the thing will, will generate something to the man of God. So Timothy was to withdraw and have nothing to do with this proud but ignorant teachers because they are injurious to the body of Christ. Their doctrine generates envy. This is in verse 4. Their doctrine generates strife, questions, envy, strife, railings, and all of that evil suspicions. That is what their doctrine promotes. Because, you see, light and darkness cannot agree. So when you bring, want to bring light and dark, no, 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 it can't work. It can't work together. So false teachers, verse 5, false teachers exploit and extort. Look at the last line of verse 5. Supposing that gain is what? Godliness. Now, to this false teacher, godliness is not gain. But gain is what? You know what that means? How to measure to this set of people, false teachers, who do not submit to the wholesome truth. How to measure godliness is on the amount of material things you have acquired. That is how to measure godliness. So, to them, gain is what? Godliness. And so, in order to show that you are godly by this doctrine, you do anything to amass wealth so that you can be among those to be recognized as godly people. Because a godly man cannot suffer. Say amen. A godly man cannot be trekking. A godly man cannot be jumping Okada. A godly man cannot be going on keke. A godly man. So to them, how to measure godliness is on the amount of material things you have acquired. So that is why godliness is not gain, but gain is godliness. Timothy, run away. Escape for your life because these guys will destroy you. They will destroy your life. Because by the time you want to do things the correct way and it, things are not working how you think it should work, you will cut corners. 
Have you not heard in this town how people go to consult juju priests so that church can grow? Church. Church. So that ministry can boom. Who do you go to draw power from? Marine kingdom. So that ministry can work. Time was when altar, you know, you used to have red carpet on the altar. Have you attended that kind of church before? Those days, red carpet on the altar. Unknown to you, naked wires are under the, the carpet. And the switch is on the pulpit with the man of God. So, we ask you to come. Come for the touch of God. Come, for, come, 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 come. So, all of you will come to the altar. Live where you are. Come, come. The Lord wants to touch you. So all of you will leave and come and stand on the red carpet. And the man of God will start the prayer. And say, Holy Spirit, move and press the switch on the light. And the naked wire will shock all of you. We we'll just electrocute all of you and release it. You fall down under electricity. Boom. That's the power of God. That's the power of God. You are dying, you know. No, what, what have people not done? Is it, is it the one of carrying all of you now, 10 people, so that we can have foreign assistance? Lie to uh, Bonke when he was alive so that we, he can give us money. We gather like this and I tell all of you, stand. We ask cameraman, video man, uh, uh, photograph, photographer to come out. And I tell you, raise your hand. When I ask you to raise your hand, wave your hand. As we are waving our hand, let the man snap. Now, the effect of that is one person's hand becomes five. So if we are ten, imagine... Ten of us, our hands, five, five times. <laughs> so you, you, you find out that in the picture, you will be seen crowd. So you send the guys the ministry, but we don't have land, we don't have this, and the people thinking they want to do evangelism, send fund. And the man of God has made it. He has blown. In this country, in this country. Because to them, what is godliness? Gain. Gain to them is godliness. So they exploit, they extort, they can do anything to make money. Anything. Anything. They can do anything to get money. It's not ready for one naira to, oh God. It can do anything so he can sell water and call it holy water. Just draw the water from our tap here and do all do like this. It's consecrated. I can dig a pool. Can dig a pool here now with this our borehole water. Okay, the one in the baptistry. And tell you it's the pool of Bethsaida. As we're having tarry nights, if you jump into it, all your problems are gone. And you didn't know the pool of Bethsaida was only a shadow of the reality. And now that the reality has come, all the types and the shadow, gone. The pool of Bethsaida was relevant when Jesus had not gone to the cross. That was when it was relevant. But now that he has gone to the cross and has paid the price for our redemption, excuse me, there is no power there again. But we have so brainwashed you that if I put water now and tell you the kind of revelation God gave me, if you jump in there, all your sorrow is gone. And you need to pay me 200000 to jump in there. You will pay. You will pay.
So we do all, is, is manipulation, is exploitation, is extortion. Because by all means, we want to make money. I can sell you mantle. I sell you mantle. <laughs> Are you? And you rush it. Both hanky and keep and arrange with the man of God. I said, as you're preaching, be cleaning your sweat, drop it. So the man was preaching, drop it, drop it, drop, you know, maybe he bought up to one carton of handkerchief. So the man is sweating like me, clean, drop, drop, drop. At the end of it, he said, come and pick one hanky with a thousand naira. How much is a single hanky? 150. And can you imagine you picking one for 1,000 and we sold two cartons of 200 dozen? How much have I made from Hanky? It's happening, and I have some people here who have bought it. Anything. They can, anything, and make it look like it's God. Just bring a picture of God into it. But if you check the scripture, it has no bearing. Christ is not in it. Christ is not in it. In fact, it speaks against the works of Christ. A strong patronage in the Christian dome. Timothy, run away from these people who think that gain is... Godliness. Gain is not godliness. But rather, look at verse 6. Gain is not godliness. But what is godliness? Godliness and contentment is what? Great gain. To so these false teachers, what is godliness? Gain. But as far as scripture is concerned, in the sight of God, godliness, contentment, is what? Is gain. It's gain. This other one will bring gain. So you pay for everything. If you have sinned, just give me 350,000, your sins are forgiven. Whatever sin you have committed, and you want to go to heaven, 350,000 takes care of your sin and gives you a passport ticket direct to heaven. No angel will stop you to check. 350,000. And imagine all of you that want to go to heaven. So you come and see the man of God. Because God has given me the key. <laughs> yeah, God has given me what? The key. And God brought cameraman to video him as he's going to bring the key. Now they see why you for this country. Give me the key. And the cameraman was videoing you. And suddenly you fell down under the anointing and key. And camera was catching God. <laughs> hey. My father, Lord, help us. Help us in this country. You know, you know, you know, I'm on a series, a series on the way, the journey to glory. So you know that is a series I, I saw I will be dealing with. The journey to, to glory. You know, we looked at the one of prodigal son. And re, as, as I was, you know, studying, preparing for, for Sunday, you know, you know what, what God revealed to me in scripture? That in order to make it, we can just arrange one kind of thing like that. Arrange it and make it look like 
God has done it and people will so see it. And it's glorious because gain is godliness. That is why we are after money. You can do anything for money because we have changed the, the pattern. The pattern is godliness and contentment. Godliness is that one is deeply committed to God. That is godliness now. A godly person is one that is devoted to God, committed to God, consecrated to God, and ready to follow after him. That is a godly person. So, as you are devoted to serve God, to worship him, to go after the way of God, to put your step where he had trod, the Bible also says contentment. So, godliness accompanied with contentment is great gain. So, it is also possible to be godly and not contented. And so, when one is supposedly godly, but that godliness Contentment is absent. Your godliness becomes rubbish. Godliness becomes rubbish. Now, remember a man who was godly. How many of you remember that man? Simon the Sorcerer. You remember Simon? When Philip went to preach, and uh, he believed, he believed. The Bible says he was a great sorcerer. He did great magic that people called him the power of God in Samaria. So when Philip came with the gospel and people turned away from idol and came to God, the Bible says Simon believed also. And so when the apostles finally came and started laying hands and people were receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the power of God was coming down on people, Simon went and carried money. Simon went and carried money and came to the chief of the apostle, Peter. He never knew he met the wrong man. He went to Peter. If it were G.O. of today. He went to Daddy Peter. I said, Daddy, I thank God for your life. Daddy, the service was powerful. I saw miracle. Daddy, I came to sow seed to your life. So that I can receive impartation. <laughs> and he brought money. Peter. Peter looked at him. And saw beyond his face. Now look at Acts chapter 8. Peter saw beyond the face. And said your heart is full of bitterness and wickedness. Your money perish with you. People are going around churches now with money to receive blessing to win a lecture. Do we have men that will look beyond the face and see the heart of the man that wants to be president? As he brings the same and say, your heart this money perish. <laughs> no, we, we, for we are, we, we don't have that liver. We don't have that liver. Geo would have received the seed from Simon. I said, lead that my son. I release upon your life. Double fall anointing. Receive. not the apostles of old. You can't buy the grace of God with money. You don't make merchandise of the grace of God. These guys who see gain as godliness make merchandise of the grace of God and you know them. Everything you want to marry, come and source it. Source it for your marriage. 
You want a good job? Come and sow seed for a good job. Do you buy the mercy of God? If it were to be bought, how much money will you pay to be alive? No, no, just tell me how much money can you pay? There are people I know that have all the money in the world, but they are not eating. They feed through the nose. They wish they can take all the money, let them live a normal life. And yet someone is standing somewhere supposedly with the grace of God and is making money. Out of what God has given freely, he released the disciples into mission and he said, listen all as you are going. Freely you have received. Freely give. Can you imagine the number of healing that took place, deliverance that took place, cleansing that took place, and they came back with no cover? No cover. But they came back with joy. What shall it profit you if you come back with all the money, but joy eludes you? Money without joy. Money, no satisfaction. Money, no peace. You have made the money, but no rest. Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In this troubled world, I will give you rest. You make all the money, no rest, no peace of mind. Made merchandise of. And so, you know, with all of these things you have done, the exploit you have done exploiting people, extorting from people, you still carry Mopo with gun to protect you because you don't feel safe. You don't, you don't feel safe. There are measures in place. But then, when it becomes a lifestyle, the angel of the Lord be with you. Guide you through your journey and bring you back safely. But I'm going with Mopo. And you are not thinking. No, you are not thinking. You came to daddy that you want to travel to Dubai. And daddy, I need your coverage. You don't need the coverage of God. Though. Whose coverage do you need? Daddy's coverage. And daddy's coverage is not cheap. You pay for daddy's coverage. And I release the blessing. And you know, daughter, you are not coming back empty handed. Yeah, you are going to Dubai. Are you, will you dare come back empty handed? It's me, you people are playing with you. Yeah. <laughs> it's me, you, are, you people are playing with me, yeah. Because you know me. It's me, you are playing with. You, know, you can just call me and say, hey, do you know, Ma. <laughs> no, no, You can do anything you want to do with me. But there are places you, you when you want to talk to me, when, <laughs> when you talk to me, you hand like this. <laughs> All of those things. And they watch you with 4G network. <laughs> but you see, with all of these things people do, Timothy was to be careful that he does not allow himself to be a victim of making merchandise of the grace of God because gain is not godliness. Rather, godliness that is accompanied with contentment is what? Is great gain. What is contentment? You are satisfied with clothes, with food. You are not in competition with anybody. A contented person is not in competition. When a contented person is okay the way God is taking him through life. Because life is in stages. So you are grateful to God at this level now. You are contented. You are not fighting. You are not trying to bring down somebody to ascend. You are not, you are not bothered that I am driving Jeep now. You are not bothered. All you know that I'm okay. Okay, climbing Okada now. I won't climb Okada forever, but 
For now, it's okay. Jesus came to be baptized by John the Baptist. And John said, ah, I'm the one that is supposed to come to you. Because John has already told people, say, I'm baptizing you with the water. But the one that is coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I'm not worthy to unless he shoes. And suddenly he saw Jesus on the queue. Ah, ah. I just finished speaking about you now. I should come to you, are you? And he said, John, suffer it to be so now. For now, this is what is required. I must go through this now. Life is progressing. Now. So, I am contented to stand on this queue for you to baptize me. I'm okay. I'm not worried. John, don't be worried. Let it be so for now. But on some of us, we want it with, with because we have been taught, brainwashed, that then is godliness. So, to show how godly you are, how fast you are growing in the spirit, it is with how much do you have in your account? What houses do you have to show? What cars do you have to show? What children? The children you have to show. My children are not studying in Nigeria. My children, where are your children? It's just to make, make mockery of you and make you look, no, a godly person, I'm contented, my children are studying in Nigeria, my children, I'm contented, I'm not in competition, I thank God for you, your children are not here, but for me, with what I have, I can conveniently pay bills and sleep well. Well, I thank God for you, we can conveniently as well do what you can do, but that doesn't make you inferior to them. So a contented person does not see himself inferior. He's just satisfied where God has kept him. Are you satisfied where God has kept and placed you for now? It's a great gain. Because if you are not satisfied with where God has kept you, you will soon rubbish your faith. You will soon rubbish your godly character, your godly status. You will soon rubbish it. You will soon rubbish your devotion to and you ask the person at the boom. Oh, what I see. A bony junk and nananyan. And you is is it nananyan that is talking to you there? I have good news for you. There is one that is ready to take away your nananyan. Says, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. I will give you satisfaction. And so when your mates that you were in school together are driving past, and they wave at you, but I don't feel bad. When your mates drive past and call you by your name and carry their child, and you don't have a wife or a husband, not to talk of a child, <laughs> just relax. This is what I'm telling you has happened to me. My classmate just saw me with a husband drive past along Potakodaba Expressway. He don't him and carried the child and showed me. This me, I'm, I'm not telling you Nollywood. <laughs> I'm telling you what this me, what has happened to this me. I show, am I in competition with you to have children? I show, and I looked. I, when I sparked somewhere in garrison and called me, I looked at the guy, I couldn't recognize him again. He mentioned it's the primary school. You know primary school? Uh, I just went, entered his air conditioned car. So where are you going? I said, I'm a pastor. I want to get to our headquarters church and all that. Oh, I just relaxed. I didn't trouble myself. Not at all. You don't rubbish your Christian status because you don't have Naira and Kobo. After all, the commodity paid on your head. You know the commodity paid on your head. Peter said, it is not silver, nor gold. I'm in Christ. Peter said, I was not bought with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. No money in the world can equate with it. You see how he values me? To buy me with what no currency in the world can be equated with. 
and then you want me to devalue myself for Naira and Kobo. You don't have it now, doesn't mean you won't have it. So be contented at every level God keeps you. Yes, why we dream, why we desire for something big. Follow God step by step. Follow him step by step. If it pleases God that you should not drive a car, it does not remove anything from your head. It doesn't. It doesn't make you less a human if in your entire life you will never drive a car or own a car. It doesn't make you less a human. So you don't allow these guys rubbish you and say to show for your godliness you show by the quality of a fabric that you wear. Fabric that you wear. And so they come to greet you. Stand up. Come to greet you. Ah, this girl is fine. She doesn't know what I am doing. I'm trying to check the quality of the stuff. And the sister is thinking I'm greeting. And I just check. Okay. And I go. I go to this one. I say, I'm getting boys in the phone. It's happen, you want me to mention the names? I, it happens here. You get them boys in the phone. You get them boys in the phone. Because you are not going. Oh, oh no. It, 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 you, you see, some, it's not good. Don't, don't walk with people blindly. Honestly. Just ask God, open my eyes. Because if you walk with people blindly, they will kill you in ignorance. Ignorance kills. If you walk with people, don't, don't be loose and careless. Because the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. You can't know it by looking at the first construction. How will she know that greeting her was not to exchange pleasantries? I wanted to check the fabric. She doesn't know. I just checked it. So we feel that when we wear the big, big things, the glittering things, that is when it shows I'm a child of God. And so when you uh, pray, the Lord, can that rapper hang one place and you finish testifying? Can't it? Can't it? Can't you tie that rapper? And throughout your testimony here, the rapper is there. Why must it be praise the Lord? Children of God. Every, every sentence. And I'm watching you. Want to show. You people just think I sit down here and um, um, sometimes when I laugh, I just uh, you can, uh, that up, can't he stay? Can't he stay? Just to make others look stupid. And you are the child of God. That God has so blessed with all the money in this world, all the connection in this world. If God has kept you there, we will discover why he has kept you there very soon before we finish this later. You will discover why he has kept you there. We will soon get there. So just hold on for me. We will soon get there to know why he has kept you there. It wasn't to make her inferior. It wasn't to make you superior to her. There's a purpose and we shall discover it from the word of God. So what I want to end with this evening is look, godliness and contentment is the gain. It is not gain that is godliness. It is not your money that proves you are godly. It is not the house you live in that shows you are a godly person. More godlier. Is there a language like that? Is there an English? Is there an English? I want to understand. Is there, if there is no English like that, it's my coinage. <laughs> Accept it. The house you live in does not make you more godlier 
than the other person. The car you drive does not make you more godlier. In fact, your, the number of children you have and how successful they are is not a proof that you are godly. It's not. Do you know, even your health still have good health. So when you want to measure godliness, it is not with material things. So Paul now puts the thing in the right perspective. Timothy, gain is not godliness, but it is godliness accompanied with contentment. That is what? The great gain. Have you, have you arrived at that position of a great gain? Where in all that we have taught, all we have been looking at, all the things we have been doing, you can say, looking at your life, I have reached that place of great contentment, of great gain, where I am satisfied with what God has given me. I am okay. I am okay. I refuse to be a preacher that will want to intimidate another preacher because of certificate. Certificate does not produce grace. Don't go to school and have certificate. Not at all. But certificate does not produce grace. Certificate can produce pride. See the difference? Can swell your head, but make your heart sick. But there is a man with a healthy heart and a small head with grace. No certificate. Certificate is not speaking for him. What is speaking for him? The grace of God. And he's contented. He's not fighting. He's not going to, to, to cut corners to get certificate to sit in a position. You go and buy certificate. You pay for certificate so that that paper can qualify you to sit in an office. You are a wicked man. And we can sweep it under the carpet for a while. But the day of judgment is coming. You know you never sat in the classroom. Never sat on, in the classroom to receive instruction and to grow, do the assignment, go through the rigors of training and learning. You just simply went through the back door, paid, and they gave you certificate, and you use it to intimidate people. In church, I'm not talking outside now, I'm talking church. Know how to dribble around and intimidate people. No, now. No. There are some people you meet and say, and they tell you, hey, excuse me, who be you? And now you would think those guys are proper. They are not. They, they've, they've weighed you and you have found wanting. You remember a man that was holding up like that and heaven weighed him and he was found wanting and they wrote on the wall a cat language. Amen, amen. Take up. A person. When God gets angry and writes a cat language. When God is annoyed and decides to speak in a cat. Oh, Archop. <laughs> you, are, you are finished. You are finished. The guy was just there drinking without a. With, he was doing fine. Drinking with gold cup. And suddenly, heaven said, Amen, Amen. They got up a person. And, uh, and he couldn't. He couldn't understand because it wasn't Babylonian language. So good enough they had Daniel. Daniel came and said, hey, okay, I wish this thing was for your enemies. You have been placed on a balance and you have found wanting. You have found wanting. Many with big titles and big colors are found wanting. And when God says a man is found wanting, he's done for. Drive all the cars, have all the big names, have all the things money can afford. And you know, they keep fighting for it. 
they will do anything to maintain that thing. That is why these guys recycle themselves in politics. The same thing we do in church. So if I'm not there, my wife will take over. My children will take over. And I tell people, go to that church, grow in that church where you don't have a general overseer, where they have a system. If you can grow and survive there, then God has called you. Not where you are the Alpha and Omega. You, the offering answers to you. The tithe answers to you. The donation answers to you. No, stay where you are not the one in charge of money. And let's know how godly you are. Yes, let's know how godly you are when you are not controlling the church fund. Let's know how godly you are. Godliness and contentment. Whether there is money or not, I'm okay. Paul, when he wrote to the Philipp Philippians, he said, I know how to live when I have plenty. And I know how to live when there is nothing. I know how to live. So, when I have much, it doesn't break my head. When I don't have, it doesn't reduce me. You don't even know. I am there. I am there. You see me now, you think I have. When I don't have. You see me, you don't even know. Does he have, does he not have? And I like that one. Hey, I like that. God will not allow you to know when I don't have. I like that one. Just want to say I want to stay there. So even if I have plenty, I won't duplicate certain things so that you wouldn't know. You still maintain status quo. So you don't know. I don't have, you don't even know. He's still there. I'm still there. These guys recycle themselves because they know they can't survive the heat you are surviving. They, no, they can't they can leave that a conditioned house with constant light, you know, running the Nepal light, but diesel is running. They can afford it because it's your money you are using to do that rubbish. They put it, and then suddenly you want to remove that person from that office to come and stay in your house. They hit one night, one night of no light. The following day, the person is in the hospital, high blood, high blood pressure. No check. What kills big people? Rich men, honestly. Let's talk through. Rich men, what, what kills them? Heart attack. Just go and check. Heart attack. High blood. All the things. High, high. Better stay where you are. <laughs> because they just stay there. Because before the high guy, all those high, high things kill you. The Lord, the, Lord, the Lord keep you contented. May greed not drive you to the way of Gehazi. May greed not drive you to the way of Judas. Judas, a godly man, but not contented. May greed not take you there. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Any question? What verse is that? Verse 6, please note it for me. Next week we build up from there. Any question? One? Yes. Ubong, come over. Any mic? Any extra microphone? You need to amplify your voice now. You know, there are some there are some men of God who who knows how to uh, you know manipulate these things. Where at, at, thank God you've given an example where if the person's uh, intention at the end is financial or you know money, you probably can tell that what this person said is is not in the way of the of God. My question is how do how do people you know tell if if they are being manipulated the wrong way, you know, if you don't really see that the way that person is going is financial, but he's actually doing the gain is um, godliness. For example, um, Paul, when uh, Paul was doing his ministry, you know, there was a time they took handkerchief from him, aprons and all that, and the sick were healed. Now, how do you tell if, if somebody else is trying to, you know, do that, but in the wrong, you know, when he gives you an instruction, like an instruction that says, maybe you drive a car to work, and the instruction comes that an innocent Christian, you know, tell if 
that instruction is actually the, uh, from God. Car to work, use public transport tomorrow. I saw danger, you using your car. God must have part time revealed things to you and you didn't understand. Reveal it to you and you didn't understand and I came with that message and the moment I release it, your spirit agrees with it and you begin to receive clarity of the revelation, the series of revelation you've been having without understanding. That message gives you clarity. So if you have be careful with all the people we claim are men of God, some are actually witchcraft. And so they can tell you don't drive your car and you, they can manipulate something if you insist. They can manipulate something. And then I said, we told him. Are you following me? So that is why you need to wear your thinking cap, put on your senses. So that by the time you receive a message that is not of God, you have the right to bind and to lose. So it's a message that does not agree with your spirit. It contradicts with what you believe. You stand in the authority in the name of the Lord and cancel it. I'll give you an example. And you should wear one shirt for two weeks. And, you know, wanting me to be part of it, ask the person to take that dress to the pastor, which was, I was the pastor of the person. I should wear it and preach. And you know I sweat. I think you know, you know I sweat a lot. I should wear it and sweat. You know, this is the only church I've pastored with AC. All the churches I've pastored, no AC. So I sweat. That scratches your car. Within these two weeks they've given you, I will resign from ministry. I'm not talking about accident. They say you have accident. But I'm saying a scratch. If there is a scratch on your car, I will resign from ministry. And I left. I'm so angry to pray. I'm not praying again. I left. You know why? This person is my flock. And the intimidating message does not, it doesn't tally at all. It doesn't tally. And I know where you are leading that person to. Once they intimidate you and bring fear upon you, you become a slave. The devil's strategy is to sponsor fear. Once he sponsors that fear and grabs you in fear, forget it, you are gone. And I told, her, I told the man, don't shake. Relax. Two weeks until the man died. He didn't have accident with that car till he died. In fact, he changed to a bigger car. And Nami still dedicated that one. So, 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 so two things. It's either they want to get you intimidated so that, you know, you can know this is the power of God. And if it doesn't agree with your spirit, bro, as a child, it's not all the message that must stand. Every child of God has a right to God. So a message comes and you stand in the authority and say, Father, this message is not from you. I know your plan for my life. And in the name